sure. Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. Yeah. Oh. Yes. Okay. okay. Great. So we'll move um, straight on to our uh, to our second uh, speaker. Um, very great pleasure to welcome him too. Um, Professor Greg Aldretti of um, the University of Wisconsin uh, Green Bay, and um, he's the uh, Frankenthal Professor of History and Humanistic Studies there, uh, and the author or co-author, I should say, of uh, the uh, the best book on the the linen uh, corslet, uh, which you know I have to say it's also the only book, but <laughs> it's very very hard to see how it could be done better. Uh, it's a very impressive piece of work and he'll be uh, telling us um, all about it uh, now. Uh, Reconstructing and Fuel Testing Ancient Linen Body Armour. Uh, great. Good morning everyone. Allow me a moment to get set up here and deploy a few more props. Sounds like it's working, so we can maybe yeah, look into it. Yeah. All right. Uh, certainly, while the most common there we go, the most common image of body armor is of a breastplate made of bronze. Uh, there is evidence that many ancient warriors, including some famous ones, such as of course Alexander the Great, uh, at times wore a corslet apparently composed of multiple layers of linen. Uh, this cloth armor has been the subject of much debate uh, and is often identified with a mysterious sort of body armor called a lenothorax, which is mentioned by a number of ancient authors. In scholarship, however, the lenothorax was, at least for a while, uh, somewhat neglected, and I think there's likely two main reasons for this. The first is the quite compelling one that, due to the inherently uh, perishable nature of its component materials, no examples have survived for us to study. And the contrast here, I think, is especially sharp when one considers the many fine examples of bronze armor that are extant. Uh, scholars, as you know, are quite fond of making typologies, but it's hard to make a typology when you have nothing to work with. The second reason is that there often seems to have been a degree of skepticism concerning whether any armor which used cloth as a basic ingredient could have offered credible protection to the wearer. So between the lack of extant examples and doubts as to its utility, uh, the lenothorax has languished or did languish for a while in relative obscurity. This is where we come in. The University of Wisconsin Green Bay Lenothorax Project has been a seven year long exercise in experimental archeology span involving university faculty, students, as well as community members, uh, which has tried to dispel at least a bit of the mystery surrounding this ancient armor. And while a number of groups and individuals, particularly uh, among the reenactor community, have previously discussed and even built very fine examples of this form of armor, their work has usually been based on a limited number of sources. And really the core, I think, of our original contribution to this uh, discussion has been to somewhat systematically collect and analyze uh, as much of the literary uh, evidence that we can find for this armor, as well as putting together a very large database of visual images of the armor in ancient art. We use this information to backwards engineer several complete sets of armor in order to assess things like their wearability, fabrication techniques, structural characteristics, and expense of manufacture. Then we also made a series of test patches. Two of them are down here in the chair, or in front of the chair, uh, employing only, we thought, the methods and materials that would have been widely available to people in the ancient world, and subjected these patches to scientifically valid, controlled uh, penetration testing by arrows to determine whether or not this sort of armor would have provided viable protection to the wearer. Our results, I think, suggest that the Lenothorax's long use on ancient battlefields may have been due to the fact that not only did it offer some surprisingly uh, effective protection, but it also may have had some practical advantages over comparable metal body armor. To give credit where credit is due, I should note that this project did not begin with me, but with one of my advanced undergraduate students, Scott Bartell, pictured here. And he was the one who really first asked these questions a number of years ago, and who on his own initiative in his basement built the first prototype of this sort of armor. 
Uh, over the last several years, it has grown, uh, somewhat alarmingly in my view, into a collaborative project involving myself, dozens, at this point perhaps hundreds of my students, uh, a number of faculty, as well as various members of the community. So, what sort of sources do we have for this type of armor? The descriptive term linothorax, meaning some sort of body armor made out of linen, shows up early and prominently in Greek literature. Uh, it's twice in Homer's uh, famous ship list. Uh, it's also used by Pliny the Elder, Strabo. Uh, it appears in multiple versions of an oracle in which the Argives are characterized as being linothorax wearing. Various named and anonymous grammarians, commentators, lexicographers also use this, uh, such as Elias Herodianus, uh, Hesychus, and overall we found, so far at least, 41 usages of the term by 27 different authors. This may not sound like a whole lot by modern standards, but for an ancient Greek word, it's a pretty solid body of evidence. And it's far more than we have for innumerable words that are universally accepted as legitimate ancient terms. These examples uh, can be further augmented by a set of ancient citations which describe body armor made of linen without actually using the word linothorax. Uh, most commonly, they use some variant of the phrase thorax linu, or a thorax of linen. And these sort of linen corslets are mentioned uh, as having been given as offerings in temples, uh, often to commemorate a military victory by Pausanias, Herodotus, Pliny the Elder, Livy, the Chronicle of Lindos, and they show up in the uh, temple inventory lists of the island of Delos. Soldiers wearing linen corslets are described by, among others, uh, Xenophon, Alcaeus, Cornelius Nepos, uh, Cassius Dio, and Silius Italicus. If we add up all of these literary references then, so far we have at least 65 distinct textual references to linen body armor by more than 40 different authors. Even if you discount the historicity of things like Homer, uh, this armor was plainly in widespread use from at least the beginning of the 6th century BC through the early 2nd century AD. And taken collectively, the surviving literary evidence uh, asserts that there was some form of body armor, sometimes called a line of thorax, which was made primarily out of linen and that was used by a wide range of ancient civilizations over a long time span. And really one remarkable aspect of that list of citations is their range, uh, both geographic, uh, cultural, and temporal. They span nearly the whole extent of the ancient Mediterranean world from the ancient Near East to the Iberian Peninsula. And just to give you a sample, uh, among the various peoples or cultures mentioned as having worn linen armor are the Egyptians, the Persians, the Phoenicians, the Macedonians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Etruscans, and the Lusitanians in Spain. So you can see this pretty much spans the whole Mediterranean. So it's a piece of armor that was available to, and at least to some degree uh, deemed desirable uh, as a form of protection by a broad range of civilizations of differing levels of material culture and wealth. Our second source material is art. And quite a number of vase paintings depict uh, soldiers, both Greeks and others, wearing a distinctive sort of armor that seems to be made out of two main pieces, a long rectangular piece that wraps around the body, uh, forming a kind of tube or cylinder around the torso. This is then uh, fastened on, or the two ends of this are fastened together with ties, usually on the left side, but not always. Then the second component is a piece that fits over the shoulders with two arm-like projections called epomides that come down on either side of the head and are then tied down on the wearer's chest. Since some of the vases clearly show warriors in the process of arming themselves bending the rectangular body section from flat to a tubular one, and since the shoulder piece is similarly bent from a flat shape to a curved one, uh, it's plain that these corslets probably are not made of something like thick metal, but they are made out of some flexible material. Uh, on the other hand, the Epomides are regularly portrayed as standing rigidly, stiffly upright before they're grabbed and bent down and secured. So the material in question also has to be fairly stiff. And this particular combination of flexibility uh, and rigidity is, is kind of unusual. But it's long been suggested that a solution for what this mysterious material may have been can be found by identifying these images with the line of thorax mentioned in ancient authors. Uh, we do believe that many, maybe most, of these images do indeed portray linotharaches. However, they could also depict armor made out of other materials, such as leather. 
Uh, it would be wrong, I think, therefore, to label all such images and art as warriors wearing a line of thorax. I should note that particularly among reenactors, uh, it's become standard to refer to this sort of armor shown in ancient art by the descriptive term Tuban yoke corslet. Uh, and this is a phrase which recalls the distinctive shapes of the two main components of the armor. For whatever reason, this terminology hasn't caught on in scholarly circles, but in his 1995 uh, book, Archaeologia on Archaic Greek Body Armor, Iro Yarva proposed a complete typology of armors in which this sort of design is labeled type 4 armor. And I think while there's no doubt that tube and yoke is a bit more uh, visually descriptive, uh, Yarva's term has the advantage of placing this armor within a broader chronological, typological, and developmental context. And so for those reasons, it's the one that we've chosen to employ. In terms of the images, we systematically tried to collect all extant images we could of type 4 armor in all sorts of forms of art. And no doubt there are many examples we've missed. We're constantly actually finding new ones. Uh, but so far, the current count is we have 913 total images on 486 different items, most of which range from around 600 BC through the first century uh, BC. Uh, to put together this list, we scoured uh, various databases of art, including, uh, I might say, all 200 published volumes of the Corpus Vesorum Antiquorum. We paged through every one of those. Uh, we also searched the online versions, various museum and exhibit catalogs. And just to break this down a little bit more precisely, what we have is 96 images on black figure vases, uh, 12 on white ground technique vases. Uh, red figure vases are 464. This is our single largest category. It's about half of the total. Uh, also, stone and terracotta sculpture, we have 166 images. Uh, and paintings, we have 27. And these are especially useful because they preserve, uh, presumably, some of the original color. Uh, finally, on bronze objects, and this is either incised bronze objects or actual statues, we have about 158 images. That includes a couple of gold ones as well. Of course, the single most famous image is that of Alexander the Great himself wearing what appears to be a line of thorax on the well-known Alexander mosaic from Pompeii. A major uh, issue of contention regarding type 4 armor is what material it was made from. Uh, the many mentions, or textual mentions, of linen body armor coupled with the flexible yet stiff qualities that we see in the vase paintings, I think certainly suggest that these two armors may well be one and the same. Sometimes the idea of linen armor is questioned or challenged on the grounds that linen was expensive and hard to obtain. And it is true that certain linens had a reputation as being somewhat of a luxury fabric in the ancient world. Uh, there were places such as Egypt which were renowned for producing expensive, very fine linen for the high-end market. However, there were a lot of coarse linens floating around as well. Uh, the flax plant from which linen is made was cultivated in nearly every region of the Mediterranean, from Spain to the Near East, even in quite unlikely places such as Germany. Uh, linen is one of the oldest and most widely used textiles. There are finds from Israel, Anatolia, and Syria that date to at least 7,000 BC. Ancient sources praise flax for the ease with which it can be grown, uh, its ability to flourish even in marginal environments, and linens of varying quality and fineness of weave were mass-produced and used for an array of even humble purposes, uh, such as fishing nets, clothing, curtains, tents, bandages, and sails. Linen is a fabric, has many uh, attractive qualities as a textile, uh, including that it dries quickly, it's very breathable, it has a high tensile strength, low elasticity, uh, good durability, and actually gets stronger when you get it wet. Uh, basic linens were a standard project manufactured in many, perhaps most, ordinary households by their female members. And these sort of coarse linens would have been nearly ubiquitous in the ancient world and fairly cheap. When discussing linen armor, a number of the literary sources mentioned that the fabric was folded or multiply. And if enough layers were piled up on top of one another, this technique certainly has the potential to create quite sturdy armor. Uh, many other cultures in later times have successfully employed similar armor in which multiple layers of fabric are stitched together, sometimes as here with additional stuffing inserted between the layers to produce a sort of quilted effect. 
Uh, several decades ago, Peter Connolly, whose wonderful paintings you can see upstairs, uh, made the interesting suggestion that rather than being sewn, perhaps the layers of a linothorax might have been laminated together with glue. And that the Greeks did have uh, the basic technology of laminating together layers of linen is attested by archaeological evidence. Uh, several sections of multi-layered laminated linen that were at least were identified by their 19th century excavators as having come from linen corselets have been found at various sites, uh, usually among caches of weapons and graves, for example at Mycenae and Tarquinia. However, those fragments really could have come from any sort of laminated object, and so I don't think they're definitive that they definitely are linen corselets, but still it's suggestive. Currently ongoing research by Professor Amy Cohen of Randolph College has revealed that the masks worn by actors in Greek plays were also likely, at least at times, made out of laminated layers of linen. And so this provides further evidence that the Greeks were quite familiar with this sort of technology and used it in various contexts. So all of this evidence was compelling enough that we decided to make some, actually most of our reconstructions from laminated layers of linen, although for comparison, we also fabricated some in which the layers were stitched together rather than glued. Uh, another leading candidate, by the way, for uh, type four armor is leather. And the argument for that often seems to rest on a belief that leather would be cheaper and more available than linen, uh, rather than being based on really solid textual evidence. But if you look at things like Diocletian's price edict and other price lists, uh, the leather of the appropriate sort, that's a very thick type that's derived from the back of an oxen, and that's what's best for making armor, that was very expensive leather. Uh, unlike linen, which could have been produced entirely by the members of a typical household, armor quality leather would probably have required the specialist services of a tanner and would probably have, have to have been bought. Uh, certainly, in some regions where cattle were common, uh, and therefore leather was common, uh, I think people would have used this for armor, but in many other regions it would have been quite rare. In the end, I suspect that much depended on local availability. Those wishing to fashion Type 4 armor would simply have used whatever they had to hand. Uh, so we should expect, I think, that Type 4 corslets made out of linen, leather, or a combination of the two materials would all have been common. And here I think it's also important to remember that every piece of armor in the ancient world was individually handcrafted, so there was likely enormous variety. Given the uh, geographic, temporal, and cultural range of the people who are attested as having used Type 4 armor, it's only reasonable to conclude that it was constructed from the complete range of materials uh, that were available or suitable. Um, in our reconstruction, uh, turning to actually trying to build this, uh, once we decided we would try to make this out of linen, my students began by studying the iconographic images and trying to backwards engineer full-scale models that would capture its distinctive shape. And the first step in this process was to conduct or construct a basic pattern for the two main components uh, and to end up with armor whose shape was identical to the ancient images involved, uh, quite frankly, a lot of trial and error. So we made mock-ups first out of heavy paper and then cardboard, tried them, then fiddled with them. Eventually, this was our first uh, pattern that we actually constructed. And this one was surprisingly complex with a number of curves and little shapes. Uh, but when we actually put it on, we found that all of these serve quite pragmatic uh, purposes. And I'll give you one example. This little tab here. Uh, it looks fairly innocuous, but when you construct the whole thing together, what that is, is it's a nice guard to protect the back of your neck from someone chopping off your head with a sword or axe from behind. So it serves a very practical purpose. Um, here, you, uh, one of the problems or challenges we faced when trying to reconstruct this was we wanted to do it using materials that were as close to authentic, or I should say as close to what might have been used in the ancient world as possible. And this proved a, a bit of a challenge. Uh, in terms of textiles, this meant obtaining linen that was made from flax plants that had been grown, harvested, and processed using only traditional methods. And this turned out to actually be our, our most difficult challenge. Uh, if you go online and search for hand-spun, hand-woven linen, you can find a lot of it. But if you look into it a little bit deeper, you'll find that most of that hand-spun, hand-woven linen has actually been made from flax plants that were machine processed and treated with modern chemicals, which actually changes the composition of the textile. 
Uh, eventually, though, we were able to make contact with a group of local traditional weavers in my own state, so they turned out to be right in our backyard, uh, who were growing flax plants, uh, literally in their backyards, harvesting, harvesting them by traditional methods, uh, spinning the resultant uh, fiber into thread, and then weaving it into linen. Uh, as you might expect, though, to obtain this sort of textile was extremely expensive, uh, something on the order in the U.S. of about $100 per square yard, which somewhat limited our ability to do this. Um, eventually, though, another solution presented itself. Uh, two other professors at my university, Professors Heidi Sherman and Allison Gates, uh, separately started a collaborative project with their students to grow flax on campus and transform it into linen using traditional methods. <laughs> Uh, professor Sherman is a medievalist who works on Viking textiles, and the other is an uh, artist, actually a professor who's an artist who uses textiles in her work, so this is very convenient. So we were able to collaborate. Uh, just to briefly give you a little bit of an idea of the steps involved in this, you of course plant your flax, uh, harvest it, red it, which means soak it in water, it gets all stinky. Uh, then you dry the fibers out, um, you break them to uh, get the husk off, you scutch them to extract the long threads, uh, you hackle them, which is you pull them through some spikes to uh, get out any impurities. Uh, then you spin it into thread, and it was a fun experience to get a bunch of male students and teach them how to use a drop spindle, so that was entertaining. And finally, you weave it uh, into thread. This is a, a modern loom, but we also built a uh, sort of Greek-style uh, loom with hanging weights that we experiment with as well. And you end up with some linen. Now, for practical reasons, we constructed a lot of our full-scale replicas out of fabric that, quite honestly, was not entirely authentic, but since the goal there was to test issues of wearability and structural form, that was okay. But for the uh, test patches, we did use the uh, historically reasonably authentic linen. Uh, and we then had to glue this together. And our process of lamination consisted of simply saturating a layer of the linen with glue adding a second layer, pressing the two together, and building up the layers. So you put another one on, and you press it. And we found it was enough just to press it together by hand. You didn't have to put weights or anything. Uh, I should note that when we tried to get greedy and laminate multiple layers at once, so we, it's important to let each layer dry, uh, but if we tried to laminate three or four layers at once, we found that our armor grew a stinky mold, which was really not desirable. Um, in terms of glues, we... This presented a problem because we know that uh, ancient cultures had things which were the equivalent almost of modern superglue. They had a very strong bond, they were waterproof, uh, helmets have been found with metal parts glued together from the bottom of rivers for 2,000 years, so this existed. Unfortunately, while we can analyze the components that went into the glue, we don't know the process for mixing it, so we could not avail ourselves of these sort of ancient superglues. Our solution to this was to go the opposite direction and say, well, we're going to use some glues that we know were so cheap and so widely available that almost anybody in the ancient Mediterranean could have used them. And ultimately, we settled on two glues, one animal, one plant. Uh, the animal one was a rabbit glue, which is made, what it sounds like, from rabbits. Uh, rabbits are ubiquitous, they're cheap, they're easily obtainable. You can make a nice glue from uh, their skin. So we made quite a few uh, examples with rabbit glue. Uh, I should note, though, uh, again, if, if you're working with rabbit glue and you own a dog, uh, <laughs> your dog will believe that you are making supremely tasty chew treats for him. Uh, I own a dog and learned this from personal experience, so keep your dog away from your arm, or at least while it's being manufactured. <laughs> Uh, we also made a glue using flax seeds. You boil the flax seeds, strain them, and you actually get a fairly a weak glue. But it was enough. It did the job. So we could say that literally anywhere that was growing linen would also have produced a glue that could be used to make this sort of armor. When uh, dried, the result was a large laminated slab. This one's about a centimeter thick here. Um, it's 17 layers. This is fairly high quality linen. And this is the very first one that I'm showing you the pictures of here. So once we had produced this big slab, we then put our pattern over it, uh, traced the patterns onto it, and cut it out. And I say cut it out very glibly, but this turned out to be a real challenge. Uh, the slab defied any sort of scissors, even large industrial ones we tried. Uh, I eventually bought a set of bolt cutters that are used to shear metal bolts. That did not cut it. 
We were finally only able to cut this using an electric jigsaw equipped with blades to cut through quarter-inch steel plates. This told us two things, and this is the, the, the <laughs> this is the joy of experimental archaeology. One, this was not the way they did this in antiquity, lacking electric jigsaws. Uh, and two, we had to come up with something different. And of course, it, it seems obvious now, you'll laugh at us, I laugh at myself, but obviously what was done in antiquity was first they cut each piece of fabric to shape and then glue them together. And subsequent to this, that's the procedure we followed as well. <laughs> Uh, you then attach the two main pieces together. You can do this with metal bolts, leather ties. You can even glue them. We did various things with various uh, models we made. You attach some tarugis, which are these uh, flaps uh, somewhat optimistically uh, put on to provide some protection for the thighs and groin area. And finally, you add a few decorative details and some painting. And here's the finished product. This was the, the first one we made. Uh, this particular example here had 17 layers, about one centimeter thick. Uh, it consumed a bolt of linen that was 16 meters long by one meter wide. Uh, and this was a large size one. This was made to fit me. So in the ancient world, they're probably a bit smaller. Uh, and it also consumed seven liters of glue. So when I say we saturated the fabric with glue, I really mean that. So uh, a lot of glue goes into these things. Uh, here I am trying it on with a vase painting next to me. You can see the similarity. You can see how the flaps stick up in the same way behind. Uh, we've worn these reconstructions, my students and I, for eight to ten hours a day. Uh, well, not I, but they have run around in them for long distances. <laughs> we've worn them in various types of weather conditions, and all of this has led to some observations about wearability, which I'll return to a bit later. Uh, we eventually, here I am, I guess, ready for action. Uh, we eventually made seven full-scale replicas of this, and one of them was an attempt to emulate the one seen on the Alexander mosaic. So here's Scott, uh, my initial student, wearing his Alexander mosaic uh, right next to the Alexander mosaic itself. So you can see uh, how similar those two are. We eventually refined the pattern a little bit. We simplified it for some of our later ones. Uh, this is one of our later patterns here. But uh, different patterns uh, produce different results. One uh, sort of side aspect of this project was having put together that huge database of images, we could do some things that really hadn't been possible before to learn about aspects of construction and design of ancient Greek armor of this era. And I just want to share a couple of observations that came out of that analysis, big sort of mathematical analysis of the database. One has to do with the application of additional scales. Uh, in modern scholarship, there's quite a lot of uh, emphasis placed on the fact that perhaps metal scales or scales made out of other materials were placed on top of the linen armor to enhance its protective abilities. But when we did analysis of all thousand images or so, we found that the scales were added only in 15% of the cases. So most ancient warriors seem to have gone with the basic uh, unadorned or unaugmented form of this armor. Uh, another thing we noticed is just slight uh, structural differences. In 60% of the cases, the shoulder flaps were curved. In 40%, they were square. And what was interesting is when we plotted this against time, uh, a chronological shift emerged. The square flaps were much more common before 500 BC, whereas rounded tend to dominate after. Similarly, a double layer of tarugues, those flaps, uh, were more common before 475. But after 475, usually you'd see a single layer. I mean, there's exceptions to both. Uh, the attachment point where you tie on the shoulder flaps, in 50% of the images, there was a single central attachment point. In 35%, there was a double parallel attachment point. Uh, in 15%, there was a fancy crossed over one. Uh, so this was interesting uh, structural things. And also in terms of decoration. I mean, if you ever wondered what did Greeks put on their armor? Uh, we were able to, again, do sort of big number crunching here, and we found that the single most common decorative design, which only occurred in 15% of cases, was this sort of star or sunburst design. Uh, certain things which we thought would be fairly common, such as the famous Greek key pattern, or so-called Greek key pattern, only showed up in 4% of cases. Uh, there were also 42 images on horseback, a significant number, and so this shows that this sort of armor was used by various types of troops, foot soldiers, cavalry, uh, and so on. All right, so we had constructed uh, a set of these. We knew something about their wearability. We knew something about the form. What about the second half of our project, where we wanted to assess, would this have provided decent protection to the wearer? 
Well, to investigate this, we made a number of experimental test patches uh, using different fabrics, different glues, different weaves, and then subjected them to penetration testing with arrows under controlled replicable conditions. And for these experiments, we made literally dozens of these test patches, roughly half a meter square. Um, we focused on arrow tests because not only would this have been one of the most common hazards encountered on the ancient battlefield, but it was a type of attack that we could precisely regulate uh, and measure and thus produce scientifically valid results. We tested for all sorts of variables, uh, both uh, differences in the construction of the patches, different layers, different direction of weave, different glues, uh, and also how we shot them, different arrows, different distances, different power bows. Uh, we attached the test patches to a foam block emulating a human torso, attached this to a heavy wooden stand. In terms of the arrows, we used uh, handmade wooden arrows with natural feather fletching. Uh, we employed lots of different arrowheads, both bronze and iron. Uh, some of these were made by blacksmiths for us, attempting to replicate ancient arrowheads. The, uh, the little red arrows are pointing to a couple of those. Uh, out of curiosity, we also employed modern arrowheads, including some razor-sharp uh, carbon steel hunting tips. Um, here's some of the bronze ones uh, on one side with a couple of the iron on the other. And just to reassure you that our arrows heads did approximate those used in the ancient world, uh, in this slide of each pair, the one on the left is one of our replicas, and the one on the right is an arrowhead uh, in the National Museum at Athens taken from an ancient battlefield, so either a, a Greek or Persian arrowhead. So we tried to get these as close as possible. We also tried to get the metallurgy as close as possible. When it came to the bow, though, we used modern compound bows, which employ a system of pulleys to have a specific hold weight. And the reason we use the modern bow rather than uh, attempted reconstruction or replica bow is because we needed to have the exact same power applied for every shot. If we had used a uh, replica bow made out of natural materials, all sorts of differences, differences in draw length, a uh, difference in the humidity in the air would have affected the power of each shot. But these sort of bows have very specific hold weights. We could measure those exactly. We used a whole range of different bows to represent uh, the range of power of bows we think were used in the time periods that we're interested in. Uh, I confess, though, out of curiosity, we employed any bow we had to hand. Uh, I owned a long bow myself, so I couldn't resist shooting it with that and with various other types of bows. Uh, we shot from different ranges, from point blank, you know, five meters away, flat line trajectory shots to longer ones, to even much longer ones, a couple hundred yards where we lofted the arrows up into the air at a 45 degree angle and they fell down on an arc. Uh, we measured the penetration of each shot. Uh, every shot was individually numbered and all the relevant data, angle, distance, arrowhead, bow, all that was recorded. And we recorded that data and did lots of number crunching. And from this we got our test results. And basically to summarize all of this, uh, the linothorax would have provided excellent protection. So for example, when you shot a one centimeter uh, test patch from 20 meters away with a 25 kilogram pull bow, the arrowhead failed to fully penetrate the test patch. Just to give you an idea of the protection this would have offered, uh, when we shot the arrow at the foam target block without any test patch on it, uh, even with our weakest bow, so this was a, a very weak 12 kilogram bow at a range of eight meters, it still had enough uh, power to penetrate 230 millimeters deep into the foam. Uh, this would be equivalent to shooting an unarmored human being, and an arrow that went that deep would nearly go through the person would be a fatal shot. But when we put uh, a one centimeter test patch, the same arrow went less than halfway through that test patch. So it's the difference between dying and being completely unscratched. Uh, late in the process, a number of documentaries were filmed about our project by various uh, Discovery Channel and other people like that. They had a lot more money than us, so one of the things they brought was a very fancy ballistics gel dummy. Uh, this is made with nice ballistics gel. It has bones, it has organs, it even bleeds. We were able to play around with this, and I'm happy to say that our results with this fancier thing were exactly the same as with our humble foam block. So it kind of reinforced our data, but with a, a little bit higher technology stuff. Overall, not surprisingly, the single most important variable was the thickness of the test patch. Uh, also, the shape and weight of the arrowhead substantially affected its penetrative power. 
Uh, but the basic sort of takeaway conclusion is that a one centimeter thick line of thorax, which is about the thickest you can make it without, uh, if you bend it over and over again, it might start to crack or delaminate. 12 millimeters, you can do it up to 12 millimeters. But that sort of thickness would have protected you from pretty much all the sorts of bows and arrowheads that likely would have been encountered on ancient battlefield from about the 6th century BC to the at least midway through the 3rd century BC. Uh, if you have a scientific cast of mind, uh, it required about 70 joules of energy to penetrate one centimeter of laminated linen. Uh, joules are often used in ballistics testing to compare different things. We also did a number of those shots where we shot up in the air at a 45 or 25 degree angle and then the arrow fell down. This is the sort of uh, mass volley archery that might have been most commonly encountered on ancient battlefield. And when we shot the test patches in that way, uh, the arrows only stuck weakly in the armor or sometimes just bounced right off. So it would have provided very good protection against that. Uh, certain things that we thought uh, would also matter didn't turn out to be so important. One thing that does matter is the angle that we shot at. Most of our shots were at a worst case scenario, 90 degrees just straight in. Uh, but on a real battlefield, the armor is curved, people would have been moving, arrows would have been coming in from an angle. And so not only would the arrow have had to penetrate a thicker expanse of armor if it hits an angle, but we found an unexpected benefit of this form of armor is that when an arrow came in at an angle, the tip of the arrow would almost get caught by the layers and start to divert between the layers. So it would almost be magically turned away from your body as it burrowed between two layers and expended its energy that way rather than penetrating straight through. Certain factors we thought would matter turned out not to. So for example, we thought that alternating the direction of weave between layers would provide much better protection. It turned out not really to matter. Um, the glues didn't seem to make a lot of difference. As long as it made a solid slab, uh, which glue we used was less than 5% uh, difference in the uh, penetration of the arrow. What did make a difference, though, was the authenticity of the linen. Our hand-woven, hand-spun, hand-processed linens consistently perform 10 to 15% better than modern linen. And at first, this puzzled us. <clears throat> but eventually, we figured out what's going on is that uh, Flax fibers in the plant are encased in a kind of waxy pectinous matrix. And if you process that in traditional ways, some of that waxy gumminess survives. And when you process it by modern chemical means, all of that's stripped away. And so our authentic slabs had a slight gummy texture, which ended up substantially increasing the protection they offered to the wearer. So the authentic linen uh, was definitely better than the modern one. We also made a number where we sewed together the layers rather than glued them. Uh, those usually performed about 10% uh, less well than the laminated. So you could certainly make one of these by just sewing together layers rather than gluing them. It would have been marginally less effective than a laminated version. We also quilted some where we stuffed between layers with uh, <coughs> densely packed things like sheep's wool. That was much inferior uh, to the, either the laminated or the sewn version. Uh, Technology makes a difference. Uh, when we shot it with a modern hunting arrowhead, it ripped right through. So the, the edge that you can put on the metal matters a lot. I mean, ancient bronze or iron is fairly soft. You can't put a sharpened edge on it. In a way, this functions a lot like a classical version of Kevlar. It's a sort of fabric compound that when it's hit, it flexes. And when it flexes, it disseminates the force of the impact mass times velocity over the entire surface rather than having it concentrate at just one point like metal armor would. And that's really the secret to how, it, how it's so effective. Uh, as a test or a comparison, we also wanted to see how it performed against bronze. So we had a blacksmith construct a number of bronze plates, uh, again trying to replicate ancient metallurgy, though that's a contentious issue. Um, the thickest ancient bronze armor seems to be about two millimeters thick, so we use plates of that thickness plus one millimeter thickness. Uh, we shot these, and the bottom line result was that roughly 10 millimeters of the laminated linen was equivalent to two millimeters of bronze. However, the linen version, if made into a complete uh, corselet, would have weighed between one third and one half the bronze. So it's equivalent protection for roughly half the weight. Uh, we also conducted some less scientific tests with whatever we could lay our hands on. 
Uh, here's a medieval mace. Um, we use swords, axes. I have a large collection of replica weapons. My students brought in things. We whacked it with anything we had. Spears and more maces. Here's a woodsman's axe. Uh, I make no claim for the scientific validity of this, but it did give us some impressions, and it, it does seem to be very tough armor. Uh, particularly blunt force trauma weapons or slashing weapons, it resisted those very effectively. Finally, uh, I decided to do a live test. <laughs> And here I need to do the requisite uh, cautionary warning. Do not attempt this at home. We are experts. We know what we're doing. Uh, this was actually, this has no scientific validity, but the, the documentaries wanted this shot. So we ended up doing it a lot. So here I am aiming it at Scott from about five meters away. Uh, anyone want to guess the result of this test? Well, sometimes things are disappointing. Uh, no, no, he was fine. He was fine. You could see the arrow would stick very dramatically in the armor, but would not penetrate. So even in this kind of real world situation, I guess, it was very effective. And one could easily imagine an ancient Greek looking like a pin cushion with arrows sticking out all over, but have his fighting ability more or less unimpaired. Uh, we eventually did quite a few of those tests as well, so it wasn't even just a one-off. All right, so what do we know in conclusion here about all this? Well, first of all, some advantages to Lyothorax. It's much cooler than metal armor. If any of you have worn metal armor, you know it's like being baked, particularly in a hot Mediterranean sun. Also, it's significantly lighter. So depending how thick you make it, uh, it's, it's a lot lighter than metal armor. Um, our reconstructions weighed about five kilograms. Comparable bronze armor would have been uh, a metal uh, breastplate, maybe 10, uh, kilograms, a uh, chainmail shirt, uh, if it's of the same length and all, would be about the same, double the weight of this. So uh, it's much more, uh, it, it's good uh, protection for uh, much less weight. And of course, the lighter your armor, the further you can run, the longer you can fight. Uh, it has the nice uh, quality of becoming stronger when wet, so this is something about linen. Uh, this does raise the issue of waterproofing. Uh, rabbit glue is a water-soluble glue. So uh, if you make it out of that sort of glue, you would have to worry about waterproofing it both outside and inside to protect it from your own sweat. Uh, we did experiment with this a little bit. Uh, we tried various, again, uh, commonly available agents to waterproof, pine resin, lanolin, uh, beeswax. Our methodology here was we constructed lots and lots of little miniature test patches, coated them with various substances, and then we subjected them to a simulated 12-hour hard rain followed by four hours of complete immersion in a bucket of water. So we thought this was a pretty severe uh, test of how waterproof they were. And what we found was that beeswax actually was the easiest uh, thing that was still very effective. It doesn't truly make it waterproof, but it makes it highly resistant. And you didn't even have to melt it on there. If you simply took a block of beeswax and rubbed it over the entire surface of the armor for 5, 10, 15 minutes, uh, it made it highly resistant to water. It survived those water tests we described, um, and it worked pretty well. Uh, it would also have a very nice side benefit of making your armor smell very pleasant, uh, which in the ancient world in a sweaty armor may have been no small thing. Um, you would have to reapply it about every other month. So like with any sort of armor, there's a certain degree of maintenance. You'd have to re-rub the beeswax on there. Um, I also once was caught in a thunderstorm in one that we had not waterproofed in any way, and I thought, oh, I've ruined my armor. Um, but I found, and sure enough, it started to come apart. The layers started to delaminate. But I found that once the rain was over, if I just pushed them back down, they glued themselves back into place just fine. So uh, it seems to be fairly resilient armor, uh, even, to, uh, even if you don't waterproof it. And I do think in the ancient world they did have some glues which are fairly waterproof. Uh, another thing is that this uses common materials and skills. You don't need to hire an expensive blacksmith. You don't need to uh, buy very expensive metal to construct this. In fact, the skills and materials to build it would have been possessed by almost any girl or woman in the ancient world, which has interesting gender uh, implications for the production of weaponry. Uh, so I could easily see in a household uh, wives making this for their husbands, mothers for their sons. And one of the things we found is that you don't have to use high quality linen. It didn't make a difference to the penetration testing. 
We at first thought that high quality linen would be much better, lots of thin layers would be better protection. We found that just a couple layers of coarse linen, once you add the glue, it really magically transforms into something different, and it was just as good protection. So you could use scraps. You could use an old blanket, old tunic, whatever you had lying around, transform it into armor without having to use this very expensive sorts of linen, and it would be just fine. Uh, because of that, it's also probably much cheaper to produce than metal armor, obviously, probably even cheaper than leather, at least in certain parts of the ancient Mediterranean. Uh, it's more comfortable than other forms of armor. I've worn lots of armor. I have a Lorica segmentata. When I wear that for eight hours, my back is killing me. Uh, but this one we found that when you wore it for a long time, particularly in the sun, or even just your own body heat, would sort of warm up the glue and soften it, and it would start to conform to your exact body shape which made it much more comfortable to wear for long periods of time than any other sort of armor that I've worn. So that's a nice advantage. And finally, as we've seen with the arrow tests, it offers decent protection. It'll uh, protect the wearer from the sorts of arrows one's likely to encounter. Uh, aspects of this project continue. We're still playing around with certain things. But our basic uh, first uh, two things we want to investigate are done. Uh, we've published that now in the form of a book, so those results are out. Uh, we also have a website, we have some videos on there, a pattern, you're welcome to check that out uh, and look at it. So, thank you very much. I also want to add, I obviously have brought one example here, and I invite anyone to come down during the breaks, take a look at, handle it, grab it, you're not going to hurt it. We also have some test patches. I have some other examples of our fabric and things. So I'm happy to talk to you individually afterwards and look at the armor. Right. Yes. Well, thank you very much for a kind of very great talk, uh, very illuminating and uh, entertaining, I might add. Um, uh, I see, uh, I have my questions lined up, and I see so many hands raised and hands passed away. Does anyone have any This would appear to be a greatly superior technology to metal armor. If that is the case, why is it that in later ages, the authentic computer in the Middle Ages, metal armor took over? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, if this is so terrific, like I'm saying, why didn't everybody use it, and why does it fall out of use? And first of all, I think even in all the periods when this was used, there was still lots of metal armor, obviously. We see it on vase paintings, we see it other places. And part of the reason for that is metal armor is a status symbol. It's flashy, it looks good. And we know even today, people like to wear high status things that proclaims their status, that shows off their wealth. So I think armor, uh, metal armor always had that cachet of being, this is more expensive, this is nicer, this shows my status. It just looks nicer, it's flashy on the battlefield. So you always had all these types of things coexisting. Why does it fall out of use? Um, it falls out of use, uh, at least in frontline military contexts, about the time the Romans come in and take over everything. And one of the answers is I think the Romans just had their own military traditions. They like to look like Romans. They're going to do their things their own way. The other is once you get down to that time period, you start to get some improvements in technology which start to render linen armor less effective. So the Romans had, not steel, but I mean, it, a better, better arrowhead, sharper arrowheads you could put a finer point on. As you saw with that slide I show you the modern ones, the sharpness of the edge you can put on the metal makes a big difference. So it started to be penetratable by new types of arrowheads. Also, you start to have more powerful bows showing up. You start eventually to get horse archers coming in uh, from uh, East Central Asia who have these more powerful bows. Those can start to penetrate it, but you can never make it much more than 10, 12 millimeters thick. Um, it does still get used in the Roman period for things like you wear this when you go hunting large cats, uh, lions and tigers. Uh, there's an example of a Roman emperor wearing it under his, to uh, under his toga as a kind of bulletproof vest, or I guess daggerproof vest. So you have it showing up in the Roman period, but no longer in those frontline military contexts because I think technology changes. Uh, we've uh, made some new constructions ourselves in our group, the uh, Hoplite Association, but we've used modern materials and glues. We find that when we wear them, they tend to go like floppy with heat. Did mm -hmm. you uh, original ones do the same? Yes. So, I mean, one of the things is it does soften in the heat, which is nice, because like I said, it molds itself to your body. If you have really intense heat, then it might start to get soft, uh, really soft. But on the other hand, uh, some of the ones we made where instead of laminating it, we just sewed it together, those are always soft. And that's not a bad thing. 
Now, you have to find a glue that will stay, not start to literally leak out or something. So that's a problem. And I think the glue is one of our least convincing parts. I mean, we use this least common denominator rabbit glue stuff. I think they had better glues in antiquity when they were experimenting with this. Um, I think some of the issues that were they would have come up with ones that stayed semi-rigid even at warmer temperatures. That's one of the areas we're still playing with. Uh, I have someone, uh, not, not even a professional academic, but somebody who used to work with lamination who's crazy about the glue question, keeps experimenting with all sorts of formulas, and I think there's a lot of work still to be done in that category. Hi, I'm Jeremy because I'm actually an expert on this subject. Um, mm -hmm. I'm here at Greenwich Taylor and I'm a textile specialist, so mm -hmm. I've looked at a lot of textiles in the Roman period, but don't have many for the Greek period, and I've published some bits of linen armor, because they do exist. And it includes one in a Greek from uh, Dura, the Rochos, which mm -hmm. is late 13th century AD. And Simon James in his catalogue suggested this was a lining that actually has got a cut in it. It doesn't go right the way through. And it's made from a completely different technique. I would like to say that all your conclusions about looking at the art and weight and flexibility and how good the penetration is, protection against penetration, all of that stands. But if you look at this type of textile from a textile specialist view, you come up with a very different answer in the construction. And so my article actually is mainly about two, some fragments from the Sardo, which I was able to look at very closely. Yeah. And I haven't yet directly studied the piece mm -hmm. from Dura, which is in Yale. But the Masada pieces are made by a technical twining. Mm -hmm. Well, you don't need any glue at all. It's a very, very thick and stiff technique. It makes um, the Sardo pieces and the Dura piece are half a centimetre thick. Mm -hmm. So quite a lot thinner than you were making. But both the structure and the material, it would make it very good for pen gauge penetration. It does appear to have a wax finish on it. And there's a technique by which linen yarn was made up until the middle of the first century BC which would retain a lot more of the pectin than in a mm -hmm. type of linen production we can describe for your neighbours. Um, so one of the reasons for its gradual disappearance would be that this earlier type of yarn, which get more of the pectin, gradually, well, it quite rapidly goes out of use in different places in Greece, we think about 500 BC. Mm -hmm. And the Masada ones, and the, uh, I guess the other ones who don't show that earlier technique. But you make it in small pieces which you sew together, so each um, flap is a separate piece, and probably the corset itself is made of separate pieces. You can make it, uh, which you sew together, and then you can replace bits, you can wash it. It wouldn't suffer, um, get weaker because of hotness, but it's very, um, it's interesting with your piece. It's a desert area, of course, so um, it's particularly useful for hot mm -hmm. situations. And I have published that. So that's it's just our publications. They were impressed at the same yep. time. Yes, and, and I think that's a perfect example of what I was talking about, how these were used by all sorts of different cultures all around the Mediterranean over a huge time span, and they're individually made, right? So different places might have employed different techniques. And this twining one, I think, certainly was something that, you know, in the east, in the desert, you have uh, attestation of. Uh, no, sorry, there, was, sorry, there were so many people with their hands up, but I mean, it's extremely interesting. Thank you very much for your point. We, we'll, 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 you, can talk, you can talk over lunch and let's let other people have a, a question. I don't mean local, it's just one, one method. I mean. okay. um, yeah, just to say, I think it's really interesting um, that uh, sort of comparing with, say, medieval cloth armors, things like Manage Axe, for example. Uh, looking at medieval sources, they're describing those maybe as 18 layers of linen, sometimes the layer of leather sandwiched in between. So it's interesting, I think, you've come up with sort of, sort of the, roughly the same sort of layers coming out of it, and that has the same sort of effect you get in medieval accounts of people walking around looking like porcupines with arrows hanging out on things like the Third Crusade and what have you. Um, what I was interested to find out was um, you've obviously done tests with regard to penetration injuries, so arrows uh, obviously aren't getting through. Do you have any idea of how effective this armor would have been against compression injuries? So, you know, bones being broken, ruptured, whatever underneath there. 
is that perhaps a reason why sort of, you know, sometimes metal armour is, beneficial, is more beneficial because that obviously spreads uh, the impact of a blow perhaps, um, whereas uh, perhaps for me, uh, is there an indication that the cloth armour isn't as effective for that? Yeah, certainly the uh, blunt force trauma injury, if you hit someone with a mace or an axe, it may not mar the outside, it may not go through the outside, but you're going to rupture organs, break bones, all that kind of stuff, which can be fatal. And if you look at the vase paintings, you'll see that underneath the armor, they always have a chitin, uh, you know, some sort of tunic, which is folded many, many times. So you have about this much fabric all sort of wadded together, which I think would have helped to provide some of that cushioning. So it's basically like having a shock absorber underneath the armor, I think for exactly this purpose. I mean, they don't need to have one that has all those folds like we see in the vase painting. You'd think it'd be much similar just to wear a, a straight shirt, but it's there, I think, to provide cushioning against exactly that sort of blow. So, same sort of principle as a Roman Sabarmalis or a medieval Gamson or Demay. Precisely. You always have to have a dish that, that both the uh, something that resists penetration and something that absorbs shock. And we see that here as well, definitely. Would you reckon that the, um, the housing of the horsehair press found on a Corinthian or, or Illyrian helmet would be made of the same linen technology rather than leather or wood, like it's sometimes suggested? Once we started to play around with the lamination, we started to think, this is great, they used it for everything. Um, and there's not evidence for that. I mean, I can't show you evidence. Uh, there are some textual references to headgear, sort of helmets made potentially out of linen or fabric. Um, I think it'd be great for greaves. Um, because that, you know, you can make them, mold them to your leg. Uh, you don't have to have them tied on. You can just sort of snap them on and off. Uh, we did experiment with all kinds of things, but we don't have ancient sources that really definitively say this was used for other types of armor as well. Though I, I can't, you know, I, I think people must have played around with that somewhat, yes. Okay, we have time for just one more question over there. And again, uh... Thank you, and thank you for a very entertaining talk. Mm -hmm. Um, I was going to put in a plea for leather armour, not just the thick oxide that you suggested, but the blue laminated leather, mm -hmm. scraps of leather, very, very cheap, vegetable yep. town. You wouldn't have the same problem with gluing it as you do with linen. Mm -hmm. You could use the natural gelatines in the leather. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think there was leather armor as well. And uh, part one of the additional parts of this project I'd love to do if we get funding is to more exhaustively explore the leather option. Um, so I, I think that was some of it. it. You know, whether leather or linen predominated, I think you have to look at specific areas at specific times and make arguments for those things. But leather is very effective as armor. I mean, there's no doubt about that. It's used in all sorts of periods. And you could use, as you say, scraps of armor and, or scraps of leather and make it out of lower quality leather as well, I suppose. Yes. Uh, no, we haven't tried that. Fortunately, none of our injuries while testing this were severe enough <laughs> to require medical intervention. Uh, but no, I mean, both these things are used in all kinds of contexts in the ancient world, and that, that's certainly the case. Um, so I, I, that would be fun to explore. There's a lot of things that are still be interesting to explore, but no, not really, no. Okay, well, that's a, that's a great note to end on, I think. Looking forward. Have a next time. Thank you.